Uh, welcome everybody to the SGB Evidence Fund webinar on reducing gender discrimination in finance. This webinar is co-hosted by my organization, the Aspen Network for, of Development Entrepreneurs, or AND, the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development, and the International Growth Center, or IGC. So very glad to have you today. So uh, let me make sure that my, my screen share is good. There we go. So we have a packed hour, um, but for the agenda, just to give you an overview of what's to come, we will have some welcome remarks from myself, uh, Director of Research and Impact at Andy. More importantly, Dean Carlin, the Agency Chief Economist for USAID. And then we'll pass it to Chris Woodruff uh, to talk about what the SGB Evidence Fund has supported and then get to the meat of this webinar, which is some new research insights on gender discrimination and access to finance from two researchers that received support from the fund. And as we go, we really encourage you to use the Q&A box with your questions as we will try our best to save some time in the end for, um, for those questions. In a moment, I'll let Chris talk about what the SGB Evidence Fund has supported, but just to give an overview in the context for why we're here, the fund is a partnership between Andy and IGC that supports researcher practitioner collaborations uh, to fill knowledge gaps on small and growing businesses, uh, specifically in developing economies. So why SGB, uh, why another acronym? <laughs> um, similar to SME, uh, small and medium sized enterprises, except we're looking specifically at those businesses that are still small, but aiming to grow, that have that ambition for scale. And they fall between that microenterprise and that large company uh, segment. And there's not enough research on this segment of businesses, even though they have the potential to be major job creators um, and, and have impact on economies and poverty alleviation. So that's why we, we undertook this project. Uh, it supports uh, researcher and practitioner partnerships, which is another key part of this fund. Uh, to ensure that we're bringing together world-class researchers with the practitioners that are working directly with these enterprises. So oftentimes that looks like accelerator programs, incubators, uh, investors, et cetera, that are aiming to help these businesses grow um, and can really benefit from that real-time you know, insight on what is actually effective in helping these businesses grow and what is the impact of these businesses on job creation, et cetera. And so I also linked to, um, as you can see, these two screenshots of the covers of these literature reviews that we produced uh, when we were first kicking off the fund to understand what research does exist on this segment of business and what are the key gaps. So uh, happy to point you to those if anyone's interested at the end um, so you can learn more. The fund has been generously supported by the Argidius Foundation, IDRC, and of course, USAID, which is um, why we're we're co-hosting today and, and very grateful for their support. So let me stop sharing my screen and introduce uh, Dean Carlin, who will give opening remarks uh, on behalf of USAID. Uh, he has a very um, impressive bio, but just to give a few highlights, most of you of course know who he is, but he is the Frederick Esther Nemers uh, Distinguished Professor at Northwestern University, co-directs the Global Poverty Research Lab at Northwestern, is the founder and former president of Innovations for Poverty Action and is very much a pioneer in, in my field. Uh, so I'm very grateful that you're able to, to provide these remarks. Um, so I'll hand it off to you, Dean, thank you. Great, Hi, and thank you very much for the gracious um, introduction. And hi everybody, I'm really excited to open this webinar and, and you know I see this as one of the, um, an example of one of the important things that the Office of the Chief Economist was created to help do, which is help bridge the bridge the communication um, and influence and that influence between academia, academics doing research on development and and donors practitioners and that that dialogue is 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 best when it's a two-way dialogue it's it's both sides listening to each other it's it's researchers hearing the questions that that activity design people are asking that they need to know where they they want to choose between a few activities and they don't know which is best. And that's that's a question that researchers want to hear, that that's a that's a that that's a need. And likewise, it's there's a plethora of research that is out there that is useful, that does speak specifically to design of, of actual aid and what can be done and and bridging that so that so that we here at USAID hear more about about fresh research that's hot off the press. And so 
webinars like this I, hopefully are a great way not of the they're not an end game but they are hopefully a conduit to uh, to to furthering that dialogue meeting people who might be eager to have a, a separate conversation and, and and feed off of their knowledge and experience and, and or, or a researcher to engage with someone at USAID and hear more about the questions that that we're asking here internally that we need to know in order to guide our decision making. The, the Office of the Chief Economist is new. I didn't know this a year ago that this was a, um, a big, the thing, that I knew there was a chief economist, but I didn't realize the distinction for an office of the chief economist. Um, we have three main objectives of the office. The first is promoting the use of cost effectiveness evidence in the agency. Um, the second is the generation of cost effectiveness evidence. And the third is macroeconomics. So the, the heart of this gathering is, is really on that first. It's promoting the use of cost effectiveness evidence and, and, a, and, a, and an important initial step in that process is just getting more exposure, meeting people, hearing about active current research and, and, and improving that dialogue, um, in, in, like I said, in, in both directions. Because ultimately we all, I think for the most part, you know, share some very common goals. And the, the challenges are all about how we achieve those goals. How do we get the most bang for our buck? Nobody wants programs that are, you know, second best when there's another alternative that's better. But the challenge, of course, is figuring out what that is and how strong that evidence is. And that's where exchanges and dialogues like this are, are, so, are so critical. Um, so I will, I will stop there and um, let's get to the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much, Dean. I really appreciate it. And so now I will introduce uh, Chris Woodruff, my colleague and um, co, uh, you know, co-lead of the SUV Evidence Fund. So um, he is a professor of development economics at uh, University of Oxford. He is the scientific coordinator for the Private Enterprise Development in Low-Income Countries, or PEDAL, which is a joint uh, research initiative of the Center for Economic and Policy Research and the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. He has many other titles, um, which we don't have time for today, but uh, he is importantly the, the research program director at the International Growth Center, uh, which is Andy's partner in this in this fund. And so he is very much a pioneer in the in the use of field experiments in firms and and in this in this field in general. Um, and we're we're really grateful to be able to work with you, Chris. So I'll hand it off to you to talk more about the fund and the introduce. <laughs> Great. So, uh, so first, let me say uh, thank you, uh, thank thanks Abby for the for the for the kind introduction, uh, and thanks to Dean and 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 the USAID uh, staff both for for being here, but also for the support for the for the program over the over the years. I think when uh, Argidius first approached us about the SGB Evidence Fund uh, a couple of uh, a couple of, uh, a few years ago, um, they were. They were quite interested in engaging academics, but in controlling academics as well. And uh, the control that the academics uh, are, are provided here is the, is the collaboration with uh, with the Aspen Network Development Entrepreneurs and the link to practitioners. And each of the each of the um, projects that we've uh, that we've funded through the SGP Evidence Fund are links between academics and mostly NGOs, sometimes government agencies, but 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 mostly mostly NGOs. And a lot of those NGOs are um, uh, or or uh, sort of uh, uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem participants in 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 country are m many of them are are, are partners of uh, uh, are, are members of of Andy. Um, we've we've had annual um, uh, uh, annual matchmaking events between practitioners and uh and, and academics um some of the projects that you see represented on this map of where which which shows where we've where we funded projects uh some of them are um uh come out of that matchmaking process some come from uh, collaborations that that researchers and and practitioners uh, develop on their own. So, um, if we can go to the next uh, slide, Abby, um, way too much information here, uh, and I'm not going to go through it all. But I wanted to give a sense of kind of the range of of projects that SGB Evidence Fund has uh, has has supported, um, uh, and you know we've broken this into 
what we see as the challenges to growth of small scale enterprises in uh, in in uh, low and middle income countries, access to labor, access to finance, access to markets and management practices and training, which includes uh, a, quite a lot of work on incubators and 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 accelerators. Uh, so so identifying and supporting high growth uh, entrepreneurs uh, and uh, all of those projects are linked on the the SGB Evidence Fund uh, webpage. So I'll I'll point you to that to get to get more information. We'll hear from. I think the main thing we wanted to do today was to provide um, um, uh, a, a sort of somewhat deeper, although these will be fifteen minute presentations, so they're they're not, not going to be the full detail, but somewhat deeper. Uh, uh, a look at a couple of the projects that we've uh, that we funded, and a couple of the projects uh, in particular that relate to uh, uh, women's entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, so I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna get to uh, get to those. But but you know I think we've we've tried to do things that are both methodological in places and that are topic based and that really kind of get at the uh, uh, clustered around the the issues that that that. Uh, uh, that are identified as kind of constraints, and again, I think what's unique about the uh, about this particular program, and and um, you know, and again, the reason we're grateful for the support of of USAID and others for this is that uh, is that these are all collaborations between um, uh, uh, entrepreneurship ecosystem partners and academic partners, and uh, and I think the ability to support that and and foster that. Uh, is, uh, is, uh, is 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 quite a useful exercise that guides us to to more practical and pragmatic uh, problems and solutions and and getting and getting people engaged with the with the practitioners uh, to the benefit of both the academics and the practitioners. As Dean said, you know the dialogue, not only this dialogue between us, but the dialogue between practitioners in the field and academics has been has been quite fruitful. So with that, let me uh, let me turn it over now and introduce uh, our first uh, speaker. Um, Amisha Miller will uh, will talk about uh, her one of the projects that the SGB Evidence Fund has has uh, has uh, supported, and I won't say so much about Amisha's research agenda because she's going to give you a sense of you know so, sort of what that is through this project. But Amisha is uh, uh, has just joined uh, the Stern School of Business at at New York University as a an assistant professor of management organizations. Uh, and uh, and she's going to talk about uh, a project on uh, on on uh, gender and uh, and uh, 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 finance of 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 small scale enterprises. So, Amisha, let me turn it over over to you. Great, thank you. So I'm just going to share screen. So bear with me. Uh, there's nothing interesting apart from the deck, hopefully. So. Here you go. All right. So this this presentation is called Asking Better Questions. Uh, it's the effect of changing investment organizations evaluation systems on gender disparities in funding innovation. Uh, a big thank you to IGC for not only funding it, but also for giving us feedback on the results that we got. Um, this is joint work with Sarah Blal, who's also on the call. Uh, and then Marcus Goldstein and Joao Montalval, who are at the World Bank's Gender Investment Lab. Um, we worked with Village Capital, which is an organization you may have heard of. I'll talk more about them. Um, and we received funding for this project uh, because it was large. So I'll, I'll dive right into it. Uh, the empirical problem, which I'm assuming that most of you will have heard of somewhere, is that equity investments tend to be concentrated into startups with male founders. Um, and you can see that in the media, uh, many equity investors are aware of this. It's difficult to escape it if you are a VC. And what that means in terms of research is that startups with female founders tend to be valued lower. This happens even when their businesses are similar or identical. Um, and this has ramifications for the types of innovations that are funded and the direction of innovation moving forward. So this is the problem we started with. And then we turn to theory to think more about it. And these types of gender disparities are often theorized as systemic and self-perpetuating issues. So first, investors tend to use homophilus networks to source deals. And what that looks like, if you're thinking about most investors being white and male, they know other people who are white and male, um, and those are the types of people they'll fund. 
secondly, evaluators and humans more broadly tend to rely on status indicators when they're making decisions in uncertain contexts. So essentially, if I have very little information, I'm going to default to using some kind of signal or symbol that someone is high status. And that can mean that they're a man uh, in a particularly male dominated industry. It can mean that they went to a really good school. And that's the kind of uh, driver that will be driving my decisions. Then there's a third piece, which is potentially more relevant to this context, but which we study less. Um, and that is that investors interact with founders differently by their gender. Uh, so when investors are interacting with founders, they'll pattern match those founders to successful innovators. So if I have uh, many white men in my portfolio already, I'll meet with people and see who reminds me of those many white men, and it's more likely to be another white man. Um, and they will ask female founders more difficult questions. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. Essentially, what this means is that investors' processes of interaction can disadvantage female founders. And we can't just get rid of these interactions because investors value them. It helps them to fill knowledge gaps in a context where they have very little information about an organization's history, and it helps them to make their decisions. Research on these gender disparities has focused on one side. Uh, so we tend to know more about what female founders are doing and can do in these interactions. Uh, we know that female founders can pitch in certain ways, and that can affect investors' biases and their decisions. The problem with this research is that it holds the investment organization constant, so it basically does not consider what an investment organization can do here. And investment organizations may be important. Lots of investors are embedded in organizations that are allocating funds to diversity and that design evaluation processes. And these types of evaluation processes they use can affect outcomes and gender disparities in other contexts. So for example, how you design your hiring process can result in different numbers of women or men getting through that process. And that led to the question, what is the effect of investment organizations evaluation practices on gender disparities and investment outcomes? And to answer this question, um, we did a lot of inductive work first. Uh, so there were interviews and observations to really understand how investors were making their decisions and where the problems might lie. And what I'm gonna show you today is our test of the effect of changing two of these commonly used organizational evaluation practices on investments in female founders. So this is a pre-registered field experiment with two stages, uh, and we're analyzing about 3,000 real investment decisions. And I'm gonna show you changes in who enters into diligence processes, and then changes in actual investment decisions. The setting is Village Capital. This is the practitioner partnership we were talking about. Uh, it is a global investment organization and we ran the experiment in four of its regions. Uh, it aimed to increase investment into startups with female founders. Um, and so this was important because they couldn't figure out how to get more female founders into their portfolio after trying things they thought were fairly obvious or that were talked about already in the literature. Uh, and that is why they let us mess around with their evaluation practices. Um, what's nice about the setting is it's a real investment process. Uh, I'm going to smush this together, but if you read the paper, you'll see we're working with professional investors and village capital trainees. Uh, what's nice as well is that we have similar pre screened startups coming into the program, and all investors have said they have a stated interest in the kinds of startups they're seeing. So what we should not be seeing is a difference being driven by uh, observable startup characteristics or investor interest. So here's the first thing we tested. We tested whether an organization could prompt systematic inquiry about risk and reward. And the reason that we did that is if you look on the bottom line C in the control group or in the wild or as a normal investor, investors don't tend to get a systematic prompt about the types of questions they should ask during interactions or afterwards. Uh, and so what tends to happen is they'll ask prevention focused questions to women. And so that will look like, are people coming back or how long do users stay on your platform? And the investor will be assessing risks associated with that uh, founder's business. In, instead, they ask promotion focused questions to men, which is how do you want to acquire customers? Uh, the investor and entrepreneur will talk about that. And the investor is really assessing uh, how a startup can grow in this context. And that results in gender disparities in evaluation. So that's the theory. 
Um, what we tried to do was to prompt systematic inquiry around both risk and reward to prompt investors to assess more consistently. And we theorized that this would reduce gender disparities in investment decisions. And here's how we did it. Uh, so in the control group, what you'll see is a prompt, which is very common in investment context, which basically says, what additional information do you want on this venture as we take it through into diligence um, or before we take it through into diligence? Uh, the prompt that we tweaked or added in this context was we asked, what is this venture's potential for growth and how this venture will mitigate risks? And so just by prompting investors to assess both, we're hoping to create this change. And here's the result, the main result, which is that systematizing risk and reward did change investors' decisions. So what you see on the graph is the left, the left hand side of the graph, the two bars there are the control group and the right hand side of the bars are the treatment group. The blue bar is startups presented by a male founder and the red bar is startups presented by a female founder. And what you see here is in the control group, there is a gap between the number of startups that investors are taking through into diligence, uh, they're taking through more men than women. When you look at the treatment group, this gap reduces uh, and you can see, actually it's very close. So they're taking almost equal numbers of men and women through diligence. And so this, um, this effect that I'm showing you, which is pre-registered is on a score, but we also assessed what happened in real life. And what happened in real life is that fewer startups with male founders and more startups with female founders went through to the next phase and actually had diligence conducted. So this really changed who was getting through into diligence. Then we looked at why this might be happening. Is it assessment uh, that changed? And we do see a change in assessment. What we predicted is that women would be asked more risk-focused questions uh, than men. And we see that directionally, but not statistically in this result. Um, and then we predicted that uh, this would be more consistent in the treatment group. And again, we see that directionally, but not, uh, not in a statistical way. Instead, what we see is this big jump between the control group and the treatment group. Everyone is being asked more questions about risk as well as reward. And so what that looks like is that in the um, control group, what you'll see is investors asking questions like, can I see a marketing plan that clearly highlights the marketing strategies? Uh, and in the treatment group, we'll see questions more like, how is this company going to manage delayed payments in case you decide to partner with a county or a national government? And so both are about how the organization is going to grow through marketing, but the questions and the, ass the assessment is, is going to be different uh, based on these questions. And so our hypothesized mechanism that was driving the change in entry into diligence was consistency of investor assessment. And we have some directional support for that, but actually our results are suggesting at something different. Um, and we think that this might be that investors are assessing prevention more for all, and they're giving less benefit of the doubt. And this is particularly relevant for startups with male founders presenting. So that's the first one. In the second phase, we tried something else. So we tried to prompt investors um, to systematically inquire about a startup's progress. Uh, and in the control group or in the wild, what you'll usually see with investors is that they're prompted to think about potential. And that's because they don't have a lot of information on a startup's existing performance um, or history. And so investors will begin to assess signs of a startup's potential. And that will be things like, do I think they have the potential market that will allow them uh, to scale? The problem with this theoretically is that evaluating potential has been shown to disadvantage female candidates in things like hiring and promotion practices. And that's because people are imagining a uh, potential for a candidate and they're more able to do that when a candidate is a man than when a candidate is a woman. However, in this setting, evaluating performance could reduce disparities. And this led us to this issue. Uh, we don't know how to evaluate performance uh, necessarily in, in our investment setting because there isn't a large his, history of organizational performance. And so this is where we turn to some of the inductive work, the interviews that we did at the beginning and came up with this hypothesis that you're seeing them over time. Let's say in a month's time from your last conversation, and this is an investor saying, I'm assessing what progress has been made on fundraising, on execution, and on data insights into how much they know about their own business. And so this is what we wanted to prompt uh, investors to think about as they were going through and interacting with startups. 
And here is the general prompt. So in the control group, Village Capital already prompted investors to assess the company's growth opportunity and the company's investment opportunity, which are very potential focused. What we added was an additional question to say, since you met them, how much has this company improved? Uh, and the idea is that investors are going to begin to assess competence and that will reduce disparities in uh, gender as they're relying on more evidence. And here's a very quick overview of the result because there are a million regressions and I don't want to scare anyone. But the big quick overview is that systematizing inquiry on progress does lead to startups with female founders being increasingly likely to receive investments. Um, that is 0 0.3 on a Z-score, which is a fairly large, uh, if you think about a Z-score as a big inverted U, it's a fairly large push um, on that inverted U. And it is, in fact, large enough to change Village Capital's investment decisions. And how did this happen? We found that the mechanism was the one we theorized here. This was the fact that investors were beginning to assess dynamically. So in the control group, investors would say things like, if I asked them, how did you decide to invest in this startup? Or how did you decide to give the startup a high score? Uh, they would say, I really like the solution and it has a lot of potential for scaling. And you can see they're assessing static uh, ways of assessing um, scaling. Whereas in the treatment group, what they're really looking at is improvement. So she's answering differently. It sounds much better. And you can see that they're improving and changing. And that's why I gave them a high score. So you can see the investors are really assessing different things. And that's driving uh, the result. So here's the result summary. Essentially, organizational making tweaks to an organization's evaluation framework can prompt different types of investor assessment, which can change. Uh, whether female founders are considered or included in investment decisions. Uh, so systematizing inquiry on risk and reward did prompt investors to give less benefit of the doubt, and that resulted in more diligence uh, for startups with female founders. Systematizing inquiry on progress led uh, investors to assess potential more dynamically, and that led to more investments for startups with female founders. We did test a, a few alternative explanations, and we didn't find support for for the ones that I've written here. The, some of the interesting ones are some of the investor characteristics. So it doesn't matter if the investor is a man or a woman or a trainee or a professional um, to make this uh, decision. Um, and if you read the paper, you'll see all the other uh, ones that we run. So here are the policy implications. Essentially how investment organizations design evaluation frameworks does affect investment decisions by found agenda. Uh, systematizing inquiry, which are the kind of tweaks that we used is a new policy lever, and you can add that to kind of bias training, hiring investors, or monitoring um, startups more. Uh, we suggest that by using systematizing inquiry, you can encourage individual investors to apply the benefit of the doubt, and that results in more equal decisions by found agenda. And you can still preserve investors' discretion to ask pertinent questions, so you're not giving them a formulaic question list that they try to escape. Um, there are obviously uh, limitations here. One is the context. This was a highly motivated organization that was already monitoring uh, gender and that had evaluation frameworks in place. So these are all things we would need to think about if we were trying to scale uh, this type of in uh, intervention. Uh, we do have a toolkit online for practitioners. Uh, Village Capital has it on their website. Uh, essentially, what that toolkit shows is how you can systematically measure what you care about, ask startups risk and reward questions, and systematically collect data on progress made. Uh, recommendations for DFIs are essentially to examine the evaluation processes of funds to understand where promising ventures might be overlooked, encourage funds to work with the um, evaluation practices we've identified, and consider implications for follow-on funding. And so essentially, who is getting through to later stage funders, because this is really an early stage intervention. Uh, thank you, uh, really open for any comments and please feel free uh, to contact me on my email or on Twitter if you use that, or X now, thanks. Great, thank you, Amisha, super clear and, 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 and concise and really covered a lot of ground. Um, there are several questions that have come in. I'm gonna I'm gonna save most of these questions for the, uh, the Q and A general Q and A session at the at, at the end. But let me ask you one question while uh, uh, Shanti kind of prepares her 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 presentation. Um, 
what was the process that the guide one of the questions was what was about is there a guide is there a is there a uh you know what what have you done with village capital to try to to try to institutionalize what you've learned from this can you say something about the process of that so you you gave us a at the end a slide that says here 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 are the guides are on village capital's website and so forth can you say something about the process the interaction you had with 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 village capital and and how how these guides came came about yeah for sure so what was really kind of cool about this project is that we had funders who were particularly interested in practitioners so igc was one of them um and kind of the point of the research for some of these founders was to, some of these funders was to explain what we learned to a wider group of people. And that's really what Village Capital signed up to do. And we obviously worked very carefully with them in thinking about how to apply this. One of the uh, processes that we used that we found was, was kind of helpful in this is thinking about how we would apply this within Village Capital's own selection process before uh, the selection process that you see. So they pre-select startups to get into this program. Um, and so we talked to them about how they would go about applying these three things, systematically measure what you care about. They felt that they had fairly well down and just kind of included a prompt reminding investors to think about it. Um, but they're asking startups both risk and reward questions and then systematically collecting data on progress made was something that we worked through with them in their own selection processes. And we found this with other investors as well, because we've been running focus groups with other investors. But we found that um, most most of the time, investors are happy to ask startups risk and reward questions. That's not a difficult thing for them to include as a prompt uh, in their in when they're training investors or when they're um, asking investors to make a decision. The one that we got quite a bit of pushback on was progress made, uh, because that suggests you have to think about something over time. And most investors will tell you that they're only seeing a startup for a short period of time. Uh, one way that we did actually apply this in Village Capital was we said the application forms come in and there is a delay before you meet with any startup afterwards. And however efficient you may be, that's usually true in an investment organization. And so we said within this, for Village Capital, often two week to one month to six weeks delay, can you ask the startup to tell you what has changed since they wrote their application form? And that will be an indicator of the progress they're making. So this was like one of the ways uh, that we worked out how to how to make this work. I think another thing that's really important is that Village Capital were motivated to try to get more women into their program. Um, so they were willing to work with us um, in thinking about how they would implement this in their own program. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And we'll come back uh, in a few minutes with with some more questions. But let me turn it over now to uh, uh, Shanti Manyan, who is uh, joining us from uh, Washington State University in Pullman, Washington, on the West Coast in the US. So Shanti, first of all, thanks for waking up so early to to join the webinar this morning. Um, uh, Shanti is a, is a professor of economics and public health at, at, at Washington uh, State University. And again, I won't say a lot about her research. She's gonna tell us some about, about that research uh, now. So without uh, further delay, let me turn it over to you, Shanti, for uh, 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 discussion of your project. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, so today I'm talking about uh, this work on discrimination and access to capital in Ethiopia. Um, this is joint with Shibru Ayalo, who's at Adama University in Ethiopia, um, and Ket Kishat at the University of Tennessee. Um, and this was uh, funded by IGC. Um, and then we're also grateful to um, the Center for Effective Global Action at Berkeley for partial funding. Um, so. Um, so the motivation for this project really starts with the fact that most women in the labor force in Sub-Saharan Africa are entrepreneurs. Um, and so the success of female businesses is really central to um, economic growth in the region. Um, but we know that there are significant gender gaps in business success. Um, and previous studies suggest that women have less access to business capital, uh, like loans and grants. So a widely held belief is that this gen these gender gaps um, are driven in part by gender discrimination um, in which the same business is treated differently because the owner is a woman. So that's what I mean by discrimination. Um, and we, we might care about discrimination just you know, simply because it's a problem from a gender equity perspective. 
um, which is important. But it also has implications for economic efficiency. Um, so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, so efficient outcomes are going to happen when financial providers target business, target capital to the highest performing businesses. So, um, in a, so, you know, those are the businesses that make the best use of the money. So in a world where female and male owned businesses perform equally well, discrimination um, may actually reduce efficiency because it directs money away from higher performing female businesses toward lower performing male owned businesses. Um, but if in reality, female and male owned businesses perform differently, maybe because of other types of barriers that women face to business success, um, then it may be the case that considering the gender of the business owner will help a financial provider um, with that decision you of you know, identifying. Oh, am I back? Chris, I think it might be on your end. I've been hearing Shanti just fine. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, great. So, um, so uh, yes, yeah, so we were talking about the situation where um, if in reality, female and male owned businesses perform differently, um, then actually considering gender might help financial providers identify the higher performing businesses. Um, and so, and then this could create sort of an equity efficiency trade-off, right? Which is important to understand for making good policy. Um, so in this paper, we're going to both study whether gender discrimination exists um, in the context of a business plan competition. And then we're gonna study these implications for economic efficiency. So we partnered with the Entrepreneurship Development Institute, which is a national agency in Ethiopia um, responsible for pro promoting entrepreneurship in the country. Um, and we ran a national level business plan competition um, that was targeted ex at existing businesses looking to expand. Um, we designed an application form that was similar to a loan application. Um, and we had about 916 applicants. And then for the judging, we recruited 84 loan officers from 10 different uh, financial institutions in, uh, in the capital of Ethiopia, which is Addis Ababa. So our first question is just, do financial providers discriminate by gender in the evaluations of these businesses um, for the business plan competition. So we're going to answer this question using a field experiment in which the business owner gender that is shown to judges um, is gonna be randomly changed on some applications. So every application is gonna be evaluated more than once by different judges. Um, and each application is going to be evaluated at least once with the correct gender and at least once with the opposite gender. Um, we have about 3,700 of these evaluations. And what's important is that these decisions have real stakes. So these, evalu these evaluations actually were used to determine the awarding of the prizes. So this is what it looks like for the judges. They see an application form. They see a bunch of characteristics about the business owner um, and this uh, this characteristic of uh, gender is going to be changed. Um, and then we call attention to uh, the gender through an application verification section that the judges have to fill out where they have to verify the gender of the application uh, as well as other characteristics of the application they're reviewing. Um, and of course, um, the, the results on that are, are most people um, are paying attention to the gender. Uh, of the applicant. So these are the results. Um, so I'm showing here the results on the final score, which was out of 20 points and determines the awards. And on the top here is the distribution of scores for uh, applications that were shown as male owned 
And on the bottom is the distribution for businesses that were shown as female owned. And what you can see is that these distributions are almost identical. Um, and so I'm showing you percentiles here, um, the 10th, 25th, 50th and 70, 75th percentile um, are identical for these two distributions. Um, and if anything, the 90th percentile is a little higher for women. So the takeaway from this is that we are finding no gender discrimination in the scores um, that determined the awards. We find no discrimination in any subset of the businesses or business owners. So we looked at a lot of subsets, like based on business size, based on business industry, as well as business owner characteristics like marital status, education, and there's no discrimination no matter how we cut the data. Um, we also asked the, the, the judges um, if they would like to forward the application for consideration for a loan at their own institution. Um, so that's another sort of real stakes uh, decision um, that is uh, aligned with what the providers do in their everyday work. And we also find no discrimination on that measure. So then moving to this question about the efficiency implications. Um, so remember I said that the efficiency implications are going to depend on whether gender um, can help providers identify higher performing businesses. And so the first question is, well, what do, what do the judges think? Do they believe that um, using gender is going to help them? Um, is, do, do they believe that female owned businesses perform differently and, and therefore gender might be useful in identifying high performing businesses? Um, and you know, maybe the lack of discrimination is sort of a preference. So we asked um, at the same time that business owner, uh, that the judges were doing the evaluations, we also asked them uh, questions about their beliefs. Um, so specifically, we asked them, what is the probability that this business will be operational in a specific month, which, is, which was about a year from, uh, from the time the applications were submitted? And then provide your best estimate of the monthly profits or losses of this business, um, again, in that particular month. Um, we wanna make sure that the providers are paying attention to this question and really providing um, their best honest answer. And so we give them a monetary incentive for accuracy, which means that they have an incentive to really give their best guess. Um, and importantly, this information was not used in the competition prize decisions. So they don't have any incentive to like manipulate their beliefs um, in, order to, uh, in order to influence the way the prizes were awarded. So we think that these are really um, their honest beliefs. And these are the results on beliefs. So on the left, um, we have their expectation on whether the business will be operational. And on the right, we have their expectation uh, for profits. And I have um, the dots represent the means, and then I have confidence intervals around them. And on the top is for, again, applications that were shown as male, and on the bottom is applications that were shown as female. Um, and we can see that, again, there are no real differences in beliefs. So. Um, you know, maybe directionally, there's uh, some belief that men are going to be a little more successful, but none of these effects are statistically significant. Okay, so we found that financial providers do, do not discriminate by gender um, and that they do not believe that gender is going to help them identify um, higher performing businesses, which is which is consistent with their, uh, their decisions on the final scores. Um, but again, you know, thinking about this equity efficiency trade-off, well, we, we need to know whether the judge beliefs are correct or incorrect. So we wanna know if the lack of discrimination actually led to the selection of lower quality businesses. 
So to answer this question, we ran an, a survey of the applicants about 18 months after the competition, and we collected data on business survival and profits. Uh, so those, those exact questions that we asked the, the uh, financial providers, um, as well as a, a host of other questions. So the first finding is that we do find a gender gap in actual business profits. So again, I'm showing you distributions of profits um, in Ethiopian Burr. On the top is the distribution for businesses that are actually male owned. So I'm moving now from the randomization to the actual ownership of the business. And then on the bottom is businesses that were actually female owned. And again, we're finding that um, the, uh, the male owned businesses appear to have higher profits sort of across the distribution. But what we really wanted to know is whether this difference in gender actually helps providers identify uh, higher performing businesses. And it's important to see that financial providers receive sub substantial information about the applicant businesses. So the question is, well, after accounting for this information, would considering business owner gender um, yield a better prediction? So we have a tool that is, um, that is very helpful in answering that question, which is machine learning. Um, machine learning is, identified, is designed to identify factors that best predict an outcome. So these are the results from um, applying a machine learning algorithm to our data to, to say what does the machine identify as the best predictors, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, as the best predictors of uh, business success. And we find that it never picks gender as an important predictor of business success once it's given all of the information that the financial providers saw. We do see that some other demographic characteristics of, um, of the business owners matter, like education. Um, and then there are several business characteristics that matter, like age, business industry, um, and, and profits at baseline. So to summarize the results, we're finding that uh, financial providers who are experienced in reviewing loans do not discriminate against female business owners in a high stakes business plan competition. Consistent with that, they expect female and male owned businesses to perform equally well in the future. Um, and a machine learning algorithm also does not discriminate. So given substantial information about a business, we find that gender is not a key predictor of business success which suggests that gen the, the gender equity we're finding did not come at a cost of selecting lower quality businesses. So uh -huh. thinking about the context and implications for these results, am I out of time? Or, no, okay. you've got um, not, not, another minute or two, it's fine. Okay, great. Um, so thinking about sort of the context for these results, um, we find that uh, we, we think that these results are informative about business capital access in Sub-Saharan Africa more generally. So we designed our application process to mimic the first stages of a loan application. Um, we used experienced judges who are financial providers in real life and regularly review loan applications. And then in addition to sort of the business plan competition, we asked them this question about whether they would like to forward the, the application to their own institution. So all of this suggests that um, we might expect, we should expect similar results when financial providers are reviewing loan applications in their everyday life. Um, and you know, similar to the loan applications, uh, providers are, are getting substantial information about the businesses when they're doing these reviews. And that, that feature is important um, because we did see that gender gap on average, but we saw that it wasn't important once we saw all of the information that was available at the businesses. 
That suggests that discrimination could emerge in settings where providers have less information about businesses. Um, but we do have this finding that despite these results on discrimination, female-owned businesses are less profitable than male-owned businesses. Um, and so that suggests a need for further research. Um, and, you know, gender gaps that uh, seem promising based on uh, follow-up surveys that we've done are um, gaps in access to collateral, um, which is a key determinant of access to credit. Um, industry segregation is important. So men tend to be concentrated um, in higher, in more profitable industries. Um, household and childcare responsibilities um, are important that might limit women's ability to, to um, devote time to their business. Um, and there's some evidence that women might face discrimination by customers. Um, so the overall takeaway is that we sort of think um, that these other obstacles driving gender gaps are really the place um, to focus going forward. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, and let me encourage people to put uh, questions in the Q&A for either of the presentations. Uh, uh, Amisha has responded to many of the uh, uh, questions uh, that uh, all of the questions actually that came in for her. I may come back to a couple of those for, for, for discussion. But let me, let me actually start with um, a question for for both of the bo both of uh, the presenters, um, which is whether we should really think these the, the on the surface the two results are quite different are quite are quite starkly different. And the question is whether we should really think of them as as being different. Of course, there are different contexts and things like that, and you can get different answers in different in different contexts. But one of the things that um, I guess if I if I were to take uh, Amisha's um, presentation uh is uh that uh you know the when you get people to ask more systematic questions uh then you get less you get less and i wonder if the process of the loan applications and so forth is those systematic questions and what the questions are in that and then the second big difference here is loans versus uh, more entrepreneurial capital, sort of more up, upside uh, risk capital, as I, under, as I understand it, venture, venture capital from the and and maybe there's a difference between um, discrimination on on projections of growth versus discriminate versus discrimination on the probability repayment uh, and and at, which is you know uh, as much about risk as it is about as as it is about growth, I guess. So let me let me stop there and, and turn it back to both of. Uh, both of you, Shanti and, and and Amisha, for for thoughts on how we how we how we bring these two these two these two sets of results together. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so I I think that this information piece is really critical. Um, that we 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 find that after accounting for the information that the financial providers see, that's when gender becomes you know, sort of unimportant in, um, in predicting outcomes. And so um, it's, I think, you know, it's a very reasonable hypothesis that, um, that we would see gender, that we would see gender discrimination in a setting where you have a lot less information about businesses, maybe like in Amisha's setting, they don't have as much of a track record. Um, and so you're, um, like she said, you're you're having to rely on sort of indicators of status or other um, sort of indicators that may or may not be directly linked to um, to business growth. Um, so I, I see this um, this information piece as really critical, and I think Amisha is finding that um, the systematic questions reduce bias is, is really consistent with that. Yeah, I think I think that's right. The way I think about it is. I think I think the information piece is right in my setting. I just I think information is very difficult to come by. So yes, it it makes sense that um it it makes sense that without information, it's difficult to uh to kind of overcome gender biases. That's really where our interventions came from. Like, how can we reduce gender biases that might be produced in the system? uh with without information or without a great deal of information and so we had to really think carefully about what types of information can be used in this context and can be relevant um and that's that's kind of where our prompts around how do you how do you systematize how people inquire come from 
uh, totally appreciate that when you have more information, um, there shouldn't be gender bias. It's great that there isn't in Shanti's setting. Um, I think there are questions about, well, what happens when there is gender bias in those settings? Um, but but obviously you guys found that there wasn't, and that's was great. Chris, I think you're on mute. Yep. Okay. Yep. So let me turn it to some of the questions that are on uh, on on the chat. So first, uh, Shanti, and then and then I'll I'll come back to some of the ones that you one of the ones that you've already answered, uh, uh, Amisha. Um, the question uh, from Diana is whether the 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 last slide the sh slide you showed us on machine learning, which showed no effect of of, of female, a lot of the other characteristics. Uh, may be quite highly correlated with with gender. So uh, uh, the the question points out widowed, but I but I wondered if that was a widowed or widower in the in in the data. So whether that is is but construction industries, sole business owners, things like that that are often uh, maybe maybe more likely to be males than females, and and may, is is that picking up? uh some some part of the gender discrimination that's that's actually showing up as as uh, sector discrimination right so i i think that's that's exactly right we're we're i think we're not saying that um we're not saying that that it, financial providers don't respond to other char characteristics that might be correlated with being female um and that's why we 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 think that our our results suggests that the focus should turn to why those, why are those uh, important factors, why are they correlated with being female, right? Um, there, there's no reason that that should be the case and um, there may be interventions we can do to change that, um, addressing um, occupational industry segregation um, and things like that. Great. Um, let me, um, Amisha, go back to one of the questions that you've You've answered in the Q and A, but ask you to elaborate a little bit, uh, a little bit more, which is um, that other studies have demonstrated that increased gender diversity is associated with increased performance. And to what extent can you test with the data that you have? Are you working on testing uh, uh, the, the sort of system systematizing inquiry on risk reward uh, against the actual portfolio of the of uh, performance of the portfolio? So I think this is a really interesting question. It's one that I've been worrying about since the beginning of the study. Um, what is a good way to measure performance in a system that we're already theorizing has systematic biases kind of inbuilt into it? Um, if we believe uh, that investors with information are going to make good decisions, we can hope that follow on investors are going to have more information and they're going to make decisions that are unbiased. And therefore, assessing how much additional funding people get is a great way to assess it. Um, if we think that startups that need follow on investment don't have great information yet, uh, that leads us to issues with um, the fact that we think many investors in the system are going to be more likely to invest in a startup led by a man than a startup led by a woman, even if the startup in all other ways is the same. Um, and that leads to a problem in the dependent variable, uh, because if, uh, if we're using additional investment as a dependent variable, which I think is the performance variable um, for a lot of funds, um, how, do we, how do we use that variable without showing this gender discrepancy and essentially showing that uh, Female founded startups don't present, don't uh, get as good uh, outcomes as male led startups. Um, and so that's something we've been thinking about a lot. Like, what are the dependent variables we can be thinking about? One of them is the type of innovation that's funded. Something that Village Capital already uses is revenue, which suggests a market need for these companies. Um, and we've been we've been thinking a lot about well, what, how do we how do we think about this and how do we measure the variables? Uh, if there's a magic way that we can machine learn our way out of this, uh, we're going to try and do that. Um, so maybe try and create some kind of a synthetic variable of what should happen uh, to a business. Uh, but it's something we're thinking really hard about. It is something we're going to track. Like I said, my concern is that the empirical data may still have some kind of inequity built into it. Fantastic. 
So we we are out of time. I think there are a couple of pending questions. I saw that that Shanti and Ketki were responding to in the in in the uh, uh, in the chat. Um, let me thank first of all the panelists. Uh, second, uh, uh, USAID and Andy for for organizing uh, the event today. Um, uh, point you to what's on the slide uh, here, which is that uh, you know these and other studies are are, are available on the SGB Evidence Fund. Uh, uh, website. A lot of the studies that I that I that I showed in the earlier uh, slide are are in process now, so the so you won't have quite as uh, as as uh, sharper results as the two that were presented today. But 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 keep a tab on that on on that link, uh, and you'll see uh, results of other uh, projects as they as they come in. So thank everyone. Thanks to everyone for uh, for participating. Thanks for the questions. A very uh, a vibrant uh, discussion of, of 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 the papers, and and we look forward to being in uh, in contact in the in in the future. Abby, let me turn it back over to you for a, a final adieu. <laughs> you said it all. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I uh, really appreciate it, and we will follow up with the slides and and further information so you can keep digging into these into these findings. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>